Hi, everyone. I'm Annie Nog. I'm thrilled to be here speaking with you today. I see a lot of black squares with white type names. If you'd be willing to show your face, please do. I'd love this to be as interactive as humanly possible, given that we're not together in person. So I'm thrilled to be here to tell you, yay, I see some more faces. Um, I'm thrilled to be telling, hi, David. I'm thrilled to be telling you more about, David's the one who told me about this opportunity. So thank you, David. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to tell you more about life coaching, especially because I think it was about eight, nine years ago, I was very seriously considering this field myself. And I had all sorts of conversations with career coaches, with career coaching certification programs to learn more about it so I could make an educated decision about whether or not it was something I wanted to pursue. So if I can be a small part of your journey in that decision, I'm very happy to be. So I just want to kind of assess who's here today and why. So that little hand that you can raise on Zoom, raise your electronic hand if you are here because you're considering getting into life coaching. I see two hands raised, four hands raised. Okay, so, so a couple people said yes to that. How many of you are here because you're interested in hiring a life coach and you're interested to learn more about what that is like? Just raise your electronic hand with that one. This is helpful just to understand why people are here. And how many of you are here out of pure curiosity because you just wanna learn about another field? Raise your hand with that one too, okay. Okay, lots of people. Okay, awesome. Um, and if you would, in the chat, just type a, maybe the number one thing that you're looking to learn here today. And I'll do my very best to speak to those things. So I'll just wait and look in the chat. Just type what you're hoping to get out of this next, whatever it is, probably 40, 45 minutes. Don't say anything yet. What's it like being a life? Yay! What's it like being a life coach? A better understanding of what the career of a life coach is like. Anyone else here for a different reason? Enlightenment. Wow, those are some big shoes to fill. Uh, career change experiences, jobs for seniors. Um, Liz, if you'd be willing, would you just type a little bit more about what you mean by that? learning to be a better employee. So today we're not going to be providing life coaching, but we will be talking about the field to understand this career and learning if it's a career fit for me to understand more. Okay. Okay. I think I'm going to speak to the majority of things. I cannot promise enlightenment. Unfortunately, I wish I could. I'm honestly here to learn anything new. Great. Okay. So with that, a few more logistical things. Uh, there, I'm going to be asking all throughout the presentation if people have questions, so please keep them coming. I want this to be as interactive as possible. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, a little bit about me. So I'll just tell you kind of a high level about me and how I got here. So I'm originally from the Midwest. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I was a very, very extroverted child and I thought I wanted to be an actress. And then I think around the age of uh, eight or nine, I started noticing that there were some mental health issues in my nuclear family and my extended family. And so I saw how important mental health was. Without mental health, we don't have much of anything. And so I thought I wanted to be a therapist all the way up until I went to college. And I was a freshman in college and I was sitting in a lecture of 200, 300 people in psychology 101. And it hit me like a ton of bricks of, you know, as, as great as I think therapy is, I didn't feel like I had the makeup to be a therapist. I have very delicate sensibilities. I didn't think I was kind of cut out to be with people at their absolute most traumatic moments. So I ended up studying something called human development and family studies. It was a mix of social sciences. Absolutely loved it had a brief stint teaching English as a foreign language and then moved to San Francisco. And after many years working in nonprofits, um, I was at JVS for almost 10 years, that's where I met David. 
I got into life coaching and I haven't really looked back since. That is not to say that it was not a terrifying first couple of years of entrepreneurship because it was, and I've still loved it the whole time. And I'll tell you more about that today, but um, I fully intend on doing this in some way, shape or form until I'm retired and maybe past retirement. Next slide, please. So why all the interest in coaching? I'll start by just bouncing it back to you all. What interests you in coaching as a field? Just go ahead and type in the chat. Don't be shy. What interests you in coaching? To be of service and the flexibility, possibility of remote work, the passion to develop others and their, to their fullest potential. Beautiful, you're in the right place. I love to inspire and inspire others. Awesome. Ability to coach victims of sexual exploitation. Oh, already coach folks. And please, if you're not already looking at the chat, do. That way we can all be interacting with each other in some way, helping others through my experiences. Beautiful. Help people and lead them. Right, just to clarify, this is about what interests you in becoming a life coach to decide if it's right for you or not. Okay, great. So these are all many reasons why people are definitely gravitated towards coaching. A recent New York Times article speaks to all of the recent growth in the field. Listen to these statistics, they're pretty staggering. Between 2015 and 2019, the number of professional coaches worldwide increased 33%. So it's a relatively new field and it's like on a very steep growth curve. Uh, let's see, there are an estimated 71,000 coaches worldwide and 23,000 based in North America. So that just gives you a sense of the fact that people are very much being drawn to these, this field for all the reasons you mentioned like flexibility, like having a job that's meaningful. I think especially after living during a global pandemic and us all having to face our own mortality, these questions really came up of, you know, what am I doing 40 to 60 hours a week and why? How do I find meaning? How do I find meaning in my work? And then also there, there is money to be made and we'll get to that part later. I think most of the very, very successful coaches who get into it, that's not the predominant reason why they get in. They get in because of reasons that you, that you, oh, I'm just looking at these beautiful answers. Yeah, that's great. I encourage you all to look at the chat as well. Thank you for sharing Deborah and Paulette and everyone else. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so like anything, there is, there is the good and there's the bad. Um, what do you imagine, type in the chat, might be some of the good that would come out of, actually forget that, people already wrote about that. Yes, I think the good is that people can feel like they're doing work that's meaningful. They can feel like very often people who get into coaching say, you know, people have been coming to me for advice my whole life. This is kind of a natural skill set I have. Um, flexibility for sure. I think people have that more than ever. And coaches very often have seen clients via phone and internet. So even before most people were working remotely, coaches were working remotely. And then also little to no overhead for coaches who work for themselves because the work is done online and done via phone. All you need really is a space where you can talk confidentially with people on the phone or on the internet and you need an internet connection. You don't need to hire people, at least at the beginning. So it's pretty, it's a pretty easy, low cost startup. In terms of the cons, I have found, and you'll hear me say all throughout this presentation, that there are many people who are drawn to coaching. They have this natural skill set, but they can't stand the idea of sales and marketing. <laughs> a coach needs both. Because if you even if you're the best, most effective coach in the world, if people don't know that you're there and that you do this, you can't apply it. You can't apply the skills. So for some people, the sales, the lead generation, the marketing is a huge con. For some people, it's not. 
especially once they find their own way. Um, instability, I would say not only with coaching, but with entrepreneurship in general, <laughs> I have found it to be a huge roller coaster. Uh, so that's, that can be a con for sure. Um, and then isolating. Some people don't like to work by themselves. They don't like the idea of not talking to people at the water cooler. They don't like the idea of not being in an in-person team meeting. So that for some people could be a con. Any questions? Oh, I see one. What are some good websites where customers rate career and life coaches? Uh, well, Yelp. Yelp is one. Google reviews, you could see reviews. And I'll get to it later, but there are also some organizations that have pools of coaches where people can find coaches through their websites and you can read reviews. One example of that is the Muse. They're based out of New York. They're a website for job seekers and career changers. I'm actually, I, I'm actually a coach, full disclosure, a coach on there, <laughs> but there are many, there are probably 60 to 80 of us on there. So any questions about the good and the bad of coaching, go ahead and type in the chat. Okay. Okay, next slide, please. Necessary skills and attributes. So coaching, I will say, just like everything else, coaching is not for everyone. I think there are certain people who do really well at it. Um, so let me ask you a few questions. I'll give you a mini quiz. So if you want to pull up a Word document or take out some pen and paper, you could just answer these questions, yes or no. I have five questions for you. Okay, so question number one. Do you enjoy deep conversations with perfect strangers? Yes or no? Question number two. Are you curious about new people and ideas? Yes or no? And, and just to clarify, the answers won't go in the chat, they'll go on your own little piece of paper or screen, whatever you're doing, computer, paper. Number three, can you be trusted with secrets? Number four, for the answers to write down, when, when you are interested in something, do you feel motivation to pursue it? And finally, number five, are you bold in putting yourself out there? Yes or no? So tally up your yeses, tally up how many yeses you had of those five questions. And I would say if you answered yes to three or more of those questions, coaching may be a fit for you. If you answered like a four or a five, I think yes. Granted, I made this up. This isn't like a, this hasn't been through any screening processes. So take it with a grain of salt. But I thought it was a fun, could you write the questions in the chat, please? I will do that. Do you enjoy the deep conversations with perfect strangers? Curious about, thank you for your patience. People and ideas. And you trusted with secrets. Why did I took a typing class? When you're interested in something, do you feel motivation to pursue it? And are you bold in putting yourself out there? Those are the five. And I see for number four, wouldn't it hold for most anyone? I mean, I would say as a life coach, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> I think very often, especially when people are doing work that doesn't feel aligned or doesn't feel connected with who they are and what they care about, very often motivation is, um, very, is missing. Um, sometimes I think even when people are interested in something they're doing, there's a block in terms of motivation. That's what I found uh, being on the side of the, the table in coaching and personally in, in my own life experience. Any other questions about uh, the fit piece, the necessary skills and attributes? Go ahead and put them in the chat if you do. 
I find it's kind of, it's a few categories. There's the presence, compassion, trust, kind of soft skills stuff. And then there's also the drive, focus, gutsiness piece. Uh, it's, that's kind of the, the combination of skills that I think makes for a really, really strong, successful coach. Okay, will this presentation be available to review later? Uh, yes, it will. I think the library is gonna send a, a link. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so here's a little bit about earning. One thing that I'll say about coaching is compared to other fields, it's a bit of a, a baby of a field. It's not very old. It's like maybe 20, 25 years old, that's it. So what that means is there's very few regulations. There's, if some people I've heard refer to it as the wild west, where people can kind of hang up a shingle without any training, for example. People can charge as much or as little as they choose. I have a suspicion that that is going to be changing. The more the field grows and the more mature it gets, I think that will be changing, probably for better or for worse, and for worse. Um, so this is what I learned from a Sherpa a website called Sherpa, and also what I've heard anecdotally. So personal coaches, and what that means is people who, their clients are individuals who hire them for coaching. They make less than corporate coaches, and they make an average of $200 an hour. Again, it is all across the board. There are some people who charge less. There are some people who charge way, way more because it's not, uh, no, there's no stipulations in terms of that. Corporate coaches make a lot more because corporations have money to pay coaches to work with their staff. Um, so they make an average of $325 an hour. Very often, it's not just a one-off session. Very often, coaches, pa coaches package their sessions. So they might say, okay, I've got a three-month package you could do or a six-month package or a 12-month package. The beauty of doing that is, one, you can make more impact because you have more time with an individual. And number two you can be a little bit more sure about your earnings and you don't have to try so hard to market, market, market for every one session you have with a client. How much better for the customer would you say in-person career coaching? Oh, that's an interesting question. There, if everyone sees in the chat, how much better for the customer would you say in-person career and life coaching is to, compared to remote coaching? When I learned at first that coaching was remote, I was very skeptical. I thought there's no way that people can do effective work remotely. And I was definitely proven wrong. I think at first I did it just via phone and I was shocked at how strong a connection could be on the phone. I think sometimes even when people felt like they weren't seen, they were even more open. More recently, I've been doing video chat with people. That's really nice because so many of the people I work with are employed and they don't have the flexibility to go in person during the weekdays when I work. It also means that someone who was in, trying to think of a time zone that would actually work. Someone who was in some other country where we spoke the same language, the time zones worked out, we could be the best match in the world. And because we can work remotely, we can work together. So it just opens up possibilities. The one last thing I'll say about that is I think it's one of the ways that differentiates coaching from therapy. I think when people think about therapy, they think of going and sitting on a couch or laying on a couch and talking. And I don't mean that with any negative connotation. I think therapy is great. I think the whole idea with coaching is where are you now, where are you going and how are you gonna get there? There's a lot of momentum. So hopefully that addresses your question. How does one know how long it will take for a client's issues to be resolved? That's a great question. Um, so what I like to do with clients is have a session on me. I don't charge them for it, like an introductory session where we have a full hour where I can learn more about them, about what they're looking to get out of coaching. So I can determine number one, can I help? Because sometimes I can't. And number two, are we a fit? And by that, all I mean is do we enjoy the conversation? Is it free flowing? Could we see talking every other week for an hour? Because sometimes personalities just don't mesh. So that's how we determine fit. I don't, I don't like the idea of blindly taking on a client when I don't know if our personalities are a match and if I can help. Um, one example of when I know I can't help is sometimes people call 
and they say, I don't know if I'm looking for a coach or a therapist. Um, and if they say something like, I'm so depressed, I can't get out of bed in the morning, or I'm still dealing with, I'm currently dealing with an eating disorder, or I was physically abused when I was younger and am still working through that. I know that I am not equipped to support them through those issues. And I wouldn't be doing them or me any favors to pretend that I could. So in that case, I would say, why don't, you know, I would recommend looking for a therapist at this point. And sometimes when the personality is not fit, I know a lot of other coaches who uh, are great and I can refer to them instead. Sometimes it's not personality, sometimes it's tools. Coaches bring very different skill sets. I would say some coaches are, if you imagine a spectrum of corporate and woo, or um, what's another word for that? Corporate and very outside the box. I'm somewhere in the middle, I think. But when I share my tools with some people, they're like, oh, that's too weird. I, I don't want to work with you. Um, in my personal opinion, I find in-person to be quite limiting and frustrating while remote offers adventure, commitment, and soul dedication. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Anything else about what people make? I think that's it. Next slide, please. Okay. Can you clarify the distinction between coaching and therapy? Great question. It's a question that I get asked all the time by potential clients. I would say, first of all, it's very hard to generalize because these days there's a lot of kinds of coaches coaching. There's a lot of kinds of therapy. Um, so I will speak in very general terms. I think of them as a Venn diagram, like two overlapping circles. I think what they have in common is that they're both a place to talk to a perfect stranger who's not a part of your day-to-day -day life, to get out of the weeds, to get some perspective, to dream, to vision. Um, the ways that I think that they are very different is number one, the trajectory. So I think with therapy, generally speaking, it's looking to your past. It's looking at what happened in the past that I'm still healing from, that I need to work through so I can move forward unencumbered. And then with coaching, it's much more so where are you now, where are you going, and how are you going to get there? There's room in both to talk about emotions. The difference is in coaching, we're talking about present emotions. So there's not a lot of storytelling. There's not a lot of someone coming in and um, like talking for an hour. It's much more of a back and forth. I hope that answered your question, Laura. If it didn't, please write more in the chat. What are your transformational principles? I'm not sure what that question means. If Deborah, if you could restate it, that would be great. Okay, so types of coaches. So for anyone who's looked into working with coaches, you can see there's a lot of different niches or niches, however you pronounce that. There's life coaches, there's executive coaches, there's health and wellness coaches, there's sex coaches, there's coaches for absolutely everything. I've got this just kind of anecdotal story to share that I think can shed some light. I think that a lot of coaches deep down are doing the same thing. When they put their niche in front of the word coach, all it is is kind of a doorway for someone to come in. So for example, a couple years ago, I was working on some networking and I got together a group of, I think it was five or six different coaches. There was a nutrition coach. There was me. I was the life coach. There was an executive coach. There was a sex coach. We got together. We talked about um, what everyone did. We supported each other in terms of learning and in terms of development in our jobs. And one thing that became very clear to, I think, all of us is we did very similar work despite having different titles. And the reason why I think that is, is because someone might come to career coaching, but to pretend that career is completely separate from who they are as a person and their spirituality and everything else, I think is silly. I think we are very multidimensional people and these things all very much connect. If you have any questions about that, let me know. Where do you market yourself other than the muse? So... I'll get to this. I'm, I'm actually going to get to that a little bit later. If I don't answer it later, let me know. Yeah, I'll get to this one about training later too. Great questions. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what do coaches do day to day? So part of the reason why I love, love, love this field is because no, the days feel very dynamic. They're not ever kind of all the same. 
I think the day depends on where you are in your business as well as what season it is. So for example, when I was first starting, I didn't have any clients to work with. So I was doing a lot of networking. I was doing some exchanges for free where I would offer coaching to a marketing person and they would teach me how to market because I knew nothing about marketing. Um, I was doing a lot of visioning, thinking about who's my ideal client, where do I find them? That was all like the first year, especially. Um, and a decent amount of that probably in the next year and still is sprinkled in. Over time, I started doing a lot more client calls and calls with prospective clients. Um, it seems in coaching, summers are slow. It's not that shocking. I think in summer, people are thinking more about playing and kind of kicking up their feet a little bit more than personal development. And so during the summer, that's when I take professional development trainings. That's when I network more. That's when I might do more of things like this, like speaking opportunities potentially. Okay. Um, so yeah, these are the kinds of things that would happen day to day. And it's always different percentages of those things. Uh, admin when I say administrative, I mean, uh, I've got spreadsheets to track how many clients am I working with and how many calls have we had this month and what, what am I making so far this year, things like that. And then also I'll send reminder emails to people the day before the calls, or they might email me between with questions about the quote unquote homework, the stuff they're working on between calls. So it's a huge mix and it makes it very interesting and very dynamic. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so education and training. So like I mentioned, this field, because it's so new, is very much wild west of a field. So some people say, you know what, I'm going to just kind of get business cards that say life coach and tell people I'm a life coach and get started. I remember when I was starting, my brother was encouraging me to do that. He said, well, if you can do that, why wouldn't you? Don't, don't go spend all that money on a training. And I said, I don't feel like I would have the skills or tools to bring. I wouldn't know what to do with clients if I got them without a training. So I personally went the certification route, but it's not required. I think the pros of certification, it can very much increase your skill set. It can increase your confidence. Um, and also there are some individuals and corporations who are seeking coaches who look to make sure that someone is certified. Not always, but, but I would say often. I would say the cons of certification is it, it takes time and money. Um, length of certification varies and the cost varies. So if you're looking for a certification program for coaches, there are so many, some are remote, some are in person, some have different focuses. The one thing that I would highly recommend is that you make sure that it's ICF approved. ICF is the governing board for the coaching field, International Coach Federation. They put their stamp of approval on some and not all certifications. So you would want to make sure it's ICF approved. I can tell you with my own certification, I went to a school, I did a lot of research. Uh, for me, it was very important that the school was uh, established, that they had been around, that they had a reputation, that employers knew who they were. So I went with a school called CTI, Coaches Training Institute. I think it's called something slightly different now. ICF stands for International Coach Federation. Deborah, I'll get to your question in just a minute. Um, so that's why I went with them. I also love that they're all over the world and they happen to have a local branch. I thought that was cool to imagine that after graduating, I would have colleagues who were all over the world. And with that particular certification, there were two parts to it. The first part took about between six and 12 months, depending on if people were working at the same time, but it was five weekend long classes. And what I love, what delighted me about those classes, I was never a fan of, um, I was never the best student in the world. And I walked into the room of those classes and it was exactly what I'd been looking for my whole life. It was like 20 people in a circle, no desks, chairs in a circle. They taught the skills and we immediately applied the skills on each other. So for people who are experiential learners, not people who just learn through hearing, it was, it was such a breath of fresh air. Also what I was not expecting, 
going through those classes, I thought I was learning how to become a coach. What I wasn't expecting is that being the recipient of coaching from the other students, I felt like I had some pretty big sh personal shifts, which was great. And then the cost. So that certification was $11,000. So it's not cheap, not cheap. Which, which could be you know, one of the cons. Again, there's all sorts of trainings, they vary. The second part of that training after the classes was it was called the certification and I was so glad I did it. Um, it was a chance to apply what you learned in the classes in small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, to you had to have five paying clients to be in the certification. And that was probably the most helpful thing I got from it. I know a lot of people who didn't do the, the second part of the certification, who they learned the skills, but they never actually took the leap to getting clients. And I'm convinced to this day that the reason I was able to is because I had to in that second part. Does that, I want to make sure that makes sense. I see there's a new message. Did you say there's an opposite of experiential learner? I don't know off the top of my head exactly what the different learning types are, but I remember some people are auditory learners. Some people need to kind of learn by doing. Um, I'm sure that other people know the other types of learning. I just know that a lot of universities assume that people are can learn through hearing and a lot of adults don't actually learn that way. Okay, back to Deborah's question in the chat. As it relates to helping your clients continue in their transformation, what tools or principles do you use to help your clients maintain their metamorphosis after the coaching engagement? without your guidance as a coach? Okay, I see two questions in there. One is around the tools and the principles. Um, there's a lot and I learned them all in the certification. I didn't come with any of them. So that's where I think to learn tools, to learn principles, today is too short to begin to get into those, but I would definitely recommend going into a training or certification program to learn the tools and principles. And then the second part, how do you maintain the metamorphosis of a coaching engagement after the engagement? So that's a really good question. So at the beginning of working, I work with most clients for about six months. We would talk every other week for about an hour. At the very beginning, we set goals and intentions for our work. We check in on them at the midpoint and at the end point to assess and celebrate progress. And then in the very last session, we set next steps. So it's kind of, we outline what they're going to be working on and doing for the next three, four months. And I keep the door open and say, listen, if you just want me to know what you're up to and you want to shoot me a, a line now and then, please do. Usually people don't take me up on that, but occasionally I do hear from people and that's always really nice. Okay. Angela talks about the different kinds of learners in the chat. Great. Okay, next slide, please. So when I was in the certification, I was kind of taking note of who was in the room, what types of uh, professionals were drawn to coaching. This is by no means to say that people who are successful coaches come from these fields. I just noticed it as a theme. So interestingly enough, there were a lot of therapists getting trained as coaches. I think they were either getting trained as coaches because they were over therapy and wanted to try something else, or because they wanted to learn coaching skills to bring into their therapy practices. Not surprising that therapists would be drawn to, co to coaching. Um, HR professionals, there were a lot of them too. A lot of them, I think, planned to keep their full-time jobs. In fact, I think a lot of their employers paid for them to get the certification. They wanted to learn this skill set to bring into their HR jobs. It was some of them were HR professionals who were trying to transition out of HR and into coaching. And then there were marketing and business people. That those people could have done marketing or business in a variety of settings. I always felt like they had a bit of a leg up as long as they were good at the actual coaching, they had a bit of a leg up on other people because they already knew how to market and put themselves out there, which a lot of people who get into this don't seem to have that skill set. Any questions about the common backgrounds of people who get into life coaching? Okay, next slide, please. I'm also doing a time check over here. Okay. 
So getting started. So if this is all sounding great uh, and you're interested in getting started or you've been certified and you want to get started, this is really all you need. You need a private space to be able to have these conversations remotely or in person if you choose. You need an internet connection. Uh, you need a process. So you need to be able to, when potential clients reach out to you, you need to be able to speak to, of course, what you will do with them and how. You need the tools, which is why I'm big on certification. And then you also need to have a some sort of presence. I think uh, one of the biggest pieces of advice I would have for people who are getting started is don't hide behind your computer. I think a lot of people feel like they need a website. They need business cards. They need like a gorgeous website. They need a really established social media presence. I, had, I have a mentor in this field who is very busy. <laughs> Uh, with coaching clients, she has never had a website or business cards. She, it just goes to show she's out from behind her computer so much and she loves life so much that I think she's into some sort of dancing, some sort of dancing and she goes every week. And so these are the people in her community. These are the people who knows what she do, who know what she does and refer people her way. So that's the big, just don't, don't hide behind your computer or think you need to have a perfect, gorgeous website before you get started. That can all come later. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, the um, where life coaches find work. Just the next one. How oh, weird. Uh-oh. I don't think I've seen growing the business. Yeah, she's definitely talking about growing the business. I've heard someone talking about growing the business. Can you go just one more back? Oh, okay, it's missing. So I'll send the update one to Angela so she can send it out. So the slide that's missing is where life coaches find work. So I learned very early on that for myself, I did not want to find all of my own clients. It was too stressful. It was like, felt like it was putting all of my eggs in one basket, so to speak. And so I started to find this contract work. So I've done some contract work with the Muse. I've done some contract work with a place called SNP, which stands for, actually stands for Smart Nice People Communications, kind of a funny acronym. They're local, they're in San Francisco. And then I've, I've interviewed with a bunch of other places, really important. Yeah, just saw your, what you wrote, David. Yeah, you don't need, you don't need a great website. You can just do it. Um, there are a lot of places that have pools of coaches where you can contract. I have found that a lot of them, I don't believe pay fairly. Um, and a lot of them have kind of their own way of coaching. So for me, I just know that that's not a fit for a lot of other people. It is. Um, and so I found a couple places to contract where it's a great fit. They kind of let people come in, they pay well, and they let you just coach the way that you like to coach. So for me, that works really, really well. Uh, it seems like there's more and more of these companies who have a pool of coaches and they market for you and then they take a cut. That's kind of how it works. There's also coaches, and I really truly don't know many or any of them, but I know that these jobs exist where you can work internal as an internal part-time or full-time coach for a company. I can't speak to that much because I just don't really know very many people who do that, but I know that those jobs exist, I think, especially in tech spaces. Okay. Yeah, SNP. SNP communications. That's right, Elizabeth. I see in the chat. Okay. Growing the business. We've spoken to this a bit. Um, many get into coaching because they're naturals at using the soft skills. People come to them. They're very approachable. They give great advice. They can be really present and compassionate with people. I think where people struggle, a lot of people with those skill sets struggle is putting themselves out there. I know for me, I knew very little about marketing. I felt really uncomfortable with it at the beginning. I had a lot of hesitations about coming across as uh, just like slimy, like in a way that I didn't want to come across. 
Um, and then over time, I think I'm six years in, I've been able to find my own voice. And now I love marketing because I found the ways that I like to do it. And that's the way I go. So I use a lot of social media, you know, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and that's kind of how I do the majority of it. And then I'll occasionally, maybe once or twice a year, send mass emails to the people I've supported for the last six years, just checking in and saying, you know, happy holidays or whatever it is. And thank you for keeping me in mind as a, as a resource. Uh, some people do newsletters. I started out with doing quarterly newsletters and I would dread it every time I saw it on my calendar. So I stopped doing newsletters. That's one of the really nice things about working for yourself is you can decide how you go about it. Uh, referrals are really big. So I, a lot of people learn about me from the internet. <laughs> it's one of the positive sides of the internet uh, through Yelp or wherever, if they just search career coach, referrals and testimonials. Okay. I see Dave's question. What are some tech companies that have internal part-time or full-time coaches? I actually don't know. I know that they exist. And I'm sure if you look on LinkedIn and search those jobs, you would find some. I'm just really not very aware of those. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Resources. I've already mentioned these, but I wanted to make sure to share them visually. So there's the International Coaching Federation. That's kind of the overarching governing board of the coaching field internationally. It's a great place to find certification programs that they've approved of. Once you're a coach, it's a great place to find professional development training, networking opportunities. They're just, they're a great resource. And I would say the resource for coaches. And then I included the link to where I, I went to get trained, which is one of many, many training places called Coaches Training Institute, which I think now has a slightly different name, but if you search Coaches Training Institute, you'll find it. Ooh, okay, last slide. Okay, so question, just wide open for questions. I know there have been questions throughout, but if you have any others, please type them. And uh, Angela, if you'd be willing to just share my my contact information in the chat, that would be great website and where they can find me. Oh, oh, you already did. Thank you. Brian shared that. Thank you. So please feel free to connect uh, online and let's see here. Yeah. I think I see a hand raised. Hello. Maybe that's not a hand raise. How did you launch your coaching business? Um, I'm trying to think to when I, how I launched my coaching business. I think one of the first things I did was when I was in that second part of the certification and I needed to find five paying clients, I just emailed almost everyone I knew. Uh, you know, previous colleagues, family members, at the time roommates, and said, hey, I'm offering, I'm in training. So I'm offering low cost coaching to people who are interested. And that it's a win-win because I need my hours and I'm offering low cost training. And um, it was just really helpful to, to, to do that. It was also very scary to do that. But that was kind of how the ball first started getting rolling. Thank you, Mario. Um, let's see here. How, what was else was involved in the launching of the coaching business? I did a lot of exchanges. I didn't feel like I had a lot of money to use to build my business. And so what I offered was coaching and I would look for what I needed and look for exchanges where it was kind of a win-win. So like I met, I found, um, a previous client who wanted more coaching was a marketing person and she helped me build my website. I didn't pay for it with money, but I paid for it with time. So th that was some of, I would definitely recommend the exchanges. Um, the difference between coaching and counseling. So I taught, I spoke to the differences between coaching and therapy. I think that would be a very different, a similar answer to this, which is more so uh, counseling, at least the way I understand counseling is very similar to therapy is like looking to someone's past, helping them heal, helping them work through issues so they can move forward. And coaching is much more so where are you now, where are you going and how are you gonna get there? So it's got a very forward moving momentum. 
How long did it take you to get to the place where you felt like you had a consistent flow of clients? I don't think you're going to like this answer. It took a while. It definitely took a while. Um, I would say it took a solid two years for me to feel confident that they were going to keep coming and for me to feel relatively busy. Full disclosure, I have two little kids, so I work part-time. I've always worked part-time. I work three days a week. Uh, some people pair coaching with another part-time job. I always recommend for people who want to go into coaching to not leap into coaching, to more so keep your paid full-time job with benefits, build your work with a couple clients a week, get your name out there, and then at a certain tipping point, then you move to coaching because it, it takes a while. Um, let's see here. Is it necessary to be certified before launching? It kind of depends on your background, I think. I mean, I, as you can tell, I'm a big fan of the certification. I think for a lot of reasons, it's extremely helpful to do that first. Um, that said, as part of the certification process, you are working with clients. So it's a little bit of a, of a process. What kind of coach would help an elderly person who's trying to accomplish educational goals and development of talents? Maybe a life coach? You know, I, on one slide, I listed all the types of coaches. That's why it wouldn't be a career coach. It wouldn't be an executive coach. I would look for a life coach. And you might even find actually coaches with a niche or a niche of people who work with people who are retired or about to retire. That would probably be a great, a great fit. You mentioned the field of coaching is only 25 years old. What type of people were filling this need before there was a job called career or life coach? That's a good question. I don't know. I'm going to guess that it was therapists. And um, I think now it's so nice that people have more of an option that it's a little bit more, there's more of a distinction. Do you coach other coaches? So this is an interesting phenomenon. And um, there are a lot of coaches who have, most of their clients are coaches. And I've heard people express some concerns that it's like a pyramid scheme. Um, I think most coaches have a coach or a therapist or they're working on themselves in some ways. So for me, it's not very concerning. I think I've only had a couple, a couple clients who are going, trying to become coaches, but it's definitely not like uh, a way that I market myself that that's who I work with. What type of coach are you? I call myself a life and career coach. I really, uh, I actively tried not to become a career coach because what I did right before I got into coaching was I worked at a workforce development company uh, organization and we worked with job seekers to help them find and keep employment. So I was a little bit burnt out with the resume and cover letter writing. So I was trying not to become a career coach. And they say that your niche always finds you. And sure enough, people kept coming to talk about job and career. Um, and so I do do a lot of that work, but I don't do it on a very logistical way. We talk a lot more about the questions underneath the resume and cover letter. We talk a lot about who are you, what do you care about, and how do you line your work and your career up with that? How do you become more aligned? How do you turn up the volume on your sense of contentment? Any other questions? Do people coach their friends? Oh my gosh, such a good question. Do people coach their friends or would you not call that coaching? Everyone is different with this. I do know some coaches who have coached family members and friends. I personally do not do that. I think one of the benefits of working with a coach is that they don't already have opinions about you and what you should do, that it's a totally unbiased person. So I personally like to uh, keep that boundary. Like I said, some people are able to do that and they do it well. I'm just not one of them. Do prospective clients often have preferences when it comes to remote versus in-person and experience or credentials of the coach? Um, I find that even if someone comes to a call thinking that they really wanna work with a coach in person, if it's a fit, 
they'll work with you remotely too. Um, there's not a lot of coaches I know who do in-person work. It, it does happen, but it's pretty rare. And let's see here. They do seem to, even if they don't know what the letters behind a name means, I think on some levels, they want to know that people were trained as a coach. I hope that answers your question, Emily. Just waiting to see if any others come through. Okay. All right. Looks like we're wrapping up. Everyone, thank you so much. This was really fun. Thank you for help making it interactive. I really dislike talking at people. Um, so nice to spend an hour with you all. Wouldn't a company that has an internal coach be a good place to work? Sure. I, yes, I think it probably would. Uh, okay. Thank, Thank you so much, Annie, for taking the time to share with us your knowledge and experience of what it's like 